Um, hello, I'm Lasse. Um, I am the founder of the open source uh, of the Koala open source community, and I want to deliver to you a talk about growing an open source community because um, I started contributing to GNOME uh, three years ago, and at the same time I founded my community, and by now um, it has seen uh, the Koala community. It has seen. Uh, over 120 different contributors from all around the world. And um, this project is actually about static code analysis, which is somebody nobody wants to do and nobody wants to work on. So I personally think this number is quite impressive. And I would like to share what we did to achieve this number so other people can uh, grow the community even better and get more newcomers on board it. So, one part about getting new contributors is, of course, getting users. Um, this is not the main focus of the talk, but I will spend a tiny bit of time on this. Um, so, this is the diagram that shows the GitHub stars for our project, which sadly is not GitHub at the moment. Um, and we see two spikes here. And there's um, one important thing about GitHub, which seems to give you the most attention, which is if you're on the GitHub trending page. So if you are on GitHub with a project, it does pay off to get a peak of stars. So you actually get onto that page, like more than 20 stars on one day, then you land on that page, and then you will get a lot of people coming to your page. Um, and, but the question is, how do you get there? How do you get some peak attention at some point of time? And we have tried a lot of things. We have tried uh, tweeting and talking at all kinds of conferences around the world, and nothing really achieved this kind of peak that is needed. It's, it's all over this kind of lines which just go up naturally, but nothing special. So actually, tweeting doesn't give you or doesn't seem to give you a lot of attention. Um, what instead seems to give you a lot of attention is Reddit and Hacker News. I don't know those platforms very well, but if you are looking for more users, apparently those are the locations where you need to go. Um, for us, it was some users who posted some posts, and then out of a sudden we had lots and lots of queries on the website and on the GitHub. Uh, we saw it on the GitHub star graph. Okay. So let's get to the core part of this talk. About, it's about getting contributors. Um, so this graph shows the number of contributors in every month for Koala, the number of unique people that have contributed. And we see two important things here. One is this little uh, hill here, and the other one is this incredible peak going up to, I think, Going up by 30 developers in one month. So um, this hill is a Google Summer of Code. And what's important to notice about this is that a Google Summer of Code gets you uh, some initial attention in the beginning because students are applying for it. And then later, uh, some of them do stay. Uh, in our case, we had two Google Summer of Code students, and both of them stayed with us and still do contributions. So if you are looking for people to stay on long term, a Google Summer of Code is definitely something to look at. And I would really, really recommend that. Of course I would, because I'm also a Google Summer of Code admin for GNOME, but that's another story. So what's this high peak here? Um, this high peak is actually a hackathon. Um, I, I don't recall even what it was called, but there was some hackathon in the beginning of the year. And there was an email at the GNOME mailing list, uh, do you want to participate in this hackathon? And at that time, I actually took the initiative and organized for GNOME to participate in this hackathon. And I also organized for Koala to participate in this hackathon. Now, I already see confusing faces, because probably nobody has heard of a hackathon in the beginning of the year. And yes, so the number of people that have contributed to GNOME as part of this hackathon is zero. Isn't that astonishing? For Koala, we had 
we had more than 30 people dropping into the IoT channel and actually contributing a patch. And for GNOME, it was zero. I, I forgot the name. I'm, I'm sorry. It was in the beginning of the year. It was some... Uh, huh? No, it, it, was, it was a company, an external company. And GNOME was listed there with several entries. And, um, well, this, this number is, is just, it is of course a bit for the show, but this is the official number of people that have successfully contributed a patch to GNOME. Um, it is probably the black number is a bit higher because it was technically a bit difficult for the students to actually get the patches uh, in officially, they had to register it somehow, and this was not particularly clearly communicated. So it was certainly a fault on my f and my side as well. But this is a huge difference, and I want to take a look at how this difference, uh, how this difference can be there. So this is about increasing the conversion rate. We have people bumping onto the project, and we want them to contribute to the project. So how can we make this as easy as possible? And there's a few things I have collected that we do and that, that do seem to work. And um, on the slides, I do have quotes some, from people that hopefully support my statements. Um, but those quotes are not from me, they are from newcomers, because I asked them, what did you like about the newcomer process? So one very, very, very important thing is to have issue levels. We have this difficulty newcomer label on GitHub issues, and GNOME has something similar. It was called GNOME Laugh back then. Nowadays it's called a uh, newcomer, it's some tag. Uh, one problem for GNOME is, in my opinion, that it's actually hard to find it, the newcomer tag. And the second problem is that it's not really actively used by most maintainers. Um, if you look at the Koala repository, at all times you will find about 40 different newcomer issues. So, and, and those newcomer issues will have uh, the, a difficulty of like, solve a typo. Um, rename this function. Something very, very simple and very, very trivial. Something that is actually more, that costs me more time to file an issue than actually solving it. And yes, it is a time effort, of course, but it helps getting users, uh, uh, getting the new contributors learning the workflow because they can concentrate on learning the workflow alone instead of being, being overwhelmed by learning the workflow and solving the issues and having several iterations over the code and the commit messages and everything. And, well, I love this quote. If I haven't had a new command task, I would have worked on the Linux kernel. Uh, so you can get this concept even further. Um, on the long term, uh, and what we have is we have actually issue levels. We don't only have a newcomer issue, but we also have difficulty low, difficulty medium, difficulty high, difficulty very high. So once a newcomer has solved his first typo issue, which is, it, it is a real issue in the project. It is not an artificially created thing, but it's very, very trivial. Once he has done it, he can climb up the ladder to the difficulty low issues. And when he feels comfortable with that, he can climb up to the difficulty medium. And with each issue, he will have to know more about the project. And he can slowly get accustomed to it. Um, I think our difficulty low is as, like equivalent to GNOME's newcomer tag. So there's, of course, the documentation. You just need that. And that it is being actively worked on by Bastian and Carlos, I think, uh, who seem to be doing a really, really good job. It has seen a lot of improvement. And I don't think we need to talk about this a lot for GNOME. So then there's this thing. When you want to enter a community, actually getting the people not only to submit a patch, but to enter the community, make them communicate to you. So one big difference between GNOME and Koala with that hackathon was that for Koala we told the people right in the description, um, come to our Jitter channel and not go to this documentation page which explains how you can contribute. So, but the first thing we told them was come to our chat and tell us that you want to be with us. 
And that is also the first thing we do when somebody comes and wants to contribute something. The first thing we do is come to our chat and tell us about it. Because we need you, so it's kind of an artificial reason, because we need you to invite you to the organization, which is a technical issue. But it's great because the people already have talked to us and they have a communication line open and at all times they can talk to us. Um, then there's also the thing of uh, responding fast. Newcomers are usually not very patient. And um, at the Koala channel, we try to respond ASAP. So when I see on my phone, while I'm eating in a restaurant, I see a newcomer message bumping in and nobody has responded to it yet. I'm actually writing a message like, I don't have time right now. I'm in a restaurant eating with my family or something. So you don't need to necessarily go into that extreme and take it over your life completely, but responding very fast, even if it is, I don't have time right now, is a very, very valuable thing that shows that you are there, that you will be responding, and that also shows implicitly that if a patch arrives, you will review it, and not in two months, but within the next week or something. This is actually how this discussion uh, started, I showed before. Please ask me something. <laughs> um, allowing non-code discussions is uh, a very useful thing to get the community going on the personal level. Uh, does GNOME actually have an off-topic channel? It doesn't, does it? At least nobody seems to know it. And it's the, it's the engagement channel or, or the docs. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think having enough topic channels is actually a nice thing. So when a computer contributor, uh, a contributor usually feels pressured to do productive uh, stuff on productive channels. But at the same time, if you have non-productive discussions, you get the community engaged more. And, enough topic, and having enough topic channel is a great way to do this. So, let's say we have the student, or the, the newcomer, he bumped into our chat, we convinced him, hey, we are great, we are responding fast, uh, we invited him into the organization, or he created his Bugzilla account, and now he has actually submitted a patch, his first patch, he's totally excited. And now we have the task of telling him, your patch sucks. Th this is shit. Go away, go somewhere else. <laughs> so what can we do instead of actually telling him this sucks? We can give him a proper code review. The first code review for an, a new contributor is always the hardest because you have to explain everything from scratch. Uh, we actually have a wiki page with uh, templates for initial responses for the most common mistakes they made. So we have a template for uh, your commit message sucks, but it's a bit more verbose and friendlier. Um, and it contains instruction on how he can fix up his commit message. Uh, usually when newcomers come to us, they have like three or four iterations just for the commit message. So uh, what I would advise is don't, don't let things slip through because just because it's a newcomer and you don't want him to annoy him, but rather be as strict as your usual are, or even stricter, because that newcomer might vanish, you have to maintain his code, and also he can learn from it. And it seems that newcomers actually value that. They learn that they can learn from you, and they learn to value reviews. That is something um, I noticed in Koala, when, especially when compared to, to uh, when working in a company where everybody hates code review, everybody hates receiving feedback about his code. Why, whereas in the Koala community, actually, people like code review in a way that they know they can improve on it and they can get better on it, as well as their code. And when it comes to code review, I think it is very wise, actually, to let the newcomers review code as soon as possible. Just in the beginning, let them review code of the seniors. So let the juniors review code of the seniors and the seniors review code of the juniors. So on every 
pull request or on every patch or whatever you have, you have the opinion, you have some fresh opinion, and you have some experienced opinion, and you have all this experience and freshness in all the contributions. And at the same time, with this you're saying, hey, I respect your opinion, I trust you to help us with our code reviews, even if it's only for senior developers, because you're sure that they are doing more or less sane stuff anyway. So let's say you have done the review. Um, the contribution got accepted. Something that can be very, very rewarding is just have an official account for your open source project and then tweet about it. We do this with every user facing change. So usually whenever a user does his first difficulty low issue, we actually tweet it out like this user has done something great and it's this. And they love it, and at the same time, our users, well, we get to tweet, which is good, which promotes us a bit, and our users have like some rolling release lock. This goes a bit together with us doing automatic pre-releases on every merge, so users can actually try it out immediately, which is probably not feasible on the GNOME infrastructure, at least not in short term, but on long term, I think it is. Which, of course, leads to automation. Um, newcomers can be annoying. In general, reviewing can be annoying. So you don't want to discuss about uh, code style questions the whole time. That's why I wrote, a, I wrote a bot that checks your code style, that checks all the static code analysis. I mean, static code analysis is what we do, so of course we have a bot for it. We actually have a bot for almost everything. If you report an issue, you get an automated response and the issue will be automatically uh, triaged in, with some issue labels. Um, my advice is automate where you can to save your time and to have an even faster response time. Even if it's a bot, you see that there's something responding immediately to me. And we're, we are slowly coming to the end. I think if you want your open source project to grow, then you have to think like a startup. You have to focus on growth versus short-term effectiveness. And you have to continue improving your processes. You have to ask your newcomers for feedback. So um, I regularly, at least every week, I ask one of the newcomers, what did you like, and especially, what did you not like about the newcomer process? What could we improve for the next one? And this is, I think, the, the last and the major point. Uh, live the spirit of the community how you want it to be. If you want to grow an open source community and you are most evil, then your com community will be most evil. <laughs> But if you, if you live the community with this kind of newcomer friendliness, you will see that most contributors will do the same kind of th service to the next newcomers. Um, and there's the sentence, what you do as a leader will be amplified. You can actually feel that when you grow an open source community. So I usually end my uh, presentations with some, uh, something I want the audience to do. And for the maintainers uh, uh, beneath you, I want you to try out at least a few of those things. If you have questions, we can have some round of questions. We have, still have some time left. Um, if you feel like those are working, tell others about it, and let's make the newcomer experience for open source suck less. And if you are a newcomer, ask the maintainer for it. Um, I basically got, in, uh, when I did my first contribution to GNOME, uh, I had to ask my mentor, uh, who wasn't my mentor at that time yet, for, uh, can you please show me an easy issue? Because I just wasn't able to find one. And he did it for me. So if you ask him about those things, he can provide them for you. And maybe he realizes, hey, that is a good thing. Maybe I should try to provide it in general for others as well. And with that, I would like to end my presentation. I would uh, love to have some discussion about uh, what do you think are good practices for uh, being newcomer friendly, for growing an, a healthy community, and any comments or questions you might have. Yes. Thank you.
Um, so I found um, what you said about code review very interesting. Uh, I don't have, uh, you know, I, I personally don't don't have the same feeling about code review. I, I really like it, like both uh, giving code reviews and uh, receiving it on my code. Uh, however, I'm curious to um, know if what you said about junior developers reviewing senior developer features, if that does not slow you down at all. Like, uh, have you ever, like, I, I can understand why it's important, um, but I could see how that can be also limiting um, uh, to to if you know if it, especially if a, if a senior developer writes a very large feature. Okay, I assume you don't do code reviews for senior developers at all. Well, maybe you do them, but it's another senior developer. Okay, so I'm not necessarily saying you should wait for a newcomer to review. So if it costs you extra time and that feature is critical, just let the next senior developer review it. But in general, well, at the, communi at, at the Koala community, we value uh, quality over delivering something in time. Um, so at some certain point in time, we do a release, and we don't care what feature goes in and what not. So if a feature isn't good enough, then we don't want to release it. And if a newcomer doesn't understand the code, the code is not good enough, not the newcomer. Oh, it, it may take the newcomer a disproportionate amount of time to understand the yes. behind the code, yes. code right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It also helps keeping your code base a bit simpler. You have a question? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an extension. Of okay. That. I, I, I think it's hard to, uh, to compare a project that is younger, like Coella, like the whole GNOME, where you have developers that are there for 20 years or something, mm -hmm. and, and the amount of complexity you have in it is, is also really different. Uh, I think you, you need to separate that um, also a bit. Um, also, I, I come from a project that had the other uh, problem, which we had a lot of hype, like a lot of hype, and we have a lot of people that were trying to come in and, and commit, and we had to filter the other way around. Like, you know, if, if we answer to every newcomer, we will just uh, wait doing that all, the, all day. And so what we separated was have an IRC and a Slack channel where we filtered people that actually con contributed something. So it's, I think it's a really good talk. I think you had a lot of really things, but I just wanted to add these because <laughs> not everything is the same. Okay. Uh, thank you for the comment. Actually, I, w I would like to clarify one of those points. Um, I did not intend to say that GNOME has a bad newcomer process. GNOME is in indeed at a totally other situation. It is this comparison I, I wanted to do earlier. Um, if you want to grow an open source community, you have to think like a startup. And if you compare Koala with GNOME, GNOME is the enterprise and Koala is the startup because GNOME has already an established community, established contributors, and GNOME needs to deliver certain things. Uh, while at Koala, we are more trying to grow than trying to deliver. And, and there's certainly a, a big and important difference to that. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to get some of this startup mess into GNOME a bit because I think it would also do you a, a bit of good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. I don't have a question, just a Well, all the things you said, they are good and valid, but I think the most important Thumbs up for that. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Um, what is the chat app that you mentioned you use? You said Jitter? Yes. So the question was what chat app we use. Um, that is actually something that is very relevant to the newcomer onboarding process because on GNOME on IRC, you usually see some people coming on the IRC, asking a question, and dropping out right ahead. And then eight minutes later, somebody responds, but the person never receives the response. So we use proprietary software, which is Jitter, because we aren't able to self-host anything. Um, and Jitter is like 
IRC but persistent and with a with a web. Yes, it's it's similar to Slack. Yeah. It it's even it's more software as a service like than Slack, which is more on premises. Okay. So I I think actually GNOME should like really really think about uh not necessarily moving away completely from IRC but moving away from IRC into something that has an IRC backend so that the seasoned developers who want to use IRC can keep using IRC, but that the newcomers can have some nice web interface and persistence, and most of all, email notifications if they drop in, ask a question, drop out, and then the response gets them by email. Yes, so there is those web-based IRC clients, uh, which also sometimes offer you persistent, but you usually need to pay for them, you need to buy a package, and that is something a newcomer will never do. That's the problem. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Okay, thanks. Then we are done for today. Thank you very much for your questions and comments and interest. I hope uh, this helps one or the other person.